So I'm really excited today to talk to you about my research about couples who take MDMA together. Uh, and obviously I completely agree with everything that you said. I think it's a really important area, an under-researched area massively. And what I'm going to call um, this like emotional bubble, which I will explain in a moment, that, that couples experience when they kind of take MDMA together. So what do we know already about MDMA use? We know a lot about how it affects the individual, how it affects their brain chemistry, how it affects their health, you know, how, what kind of experiences they might, they might have on MDMA, um, also some of the meanings of those experiences as well. Um, but most of this research is quite time limited, so it mainly focuses on when people take MDMA, maybe a few days afterwards. The kind of longer term effects are sort of less well known, um, though there is a sort of more within kind of health research about longer term effects. So what's missing? So instead of just thinking about how MDMA impacts the individual person, what about how it impacts the connections or the social dynamics between people? So it's really kind of um, a kind of shift in focus that I want to kind of bring to this area. And within that is a kind of sense of the emotional experiences people have as well. Uh, and I just chose to focus particularly on couples for two reasons. The first is that couples is incredibly under-researched area. Uh, there's literally like a handful of studies, which seems bizarre to me when you think about uh, kind of how the two main uh, kind of experiences of MDMA, where you're very empathetic, you're very open, you know, that kind of seems like it would have a big impact on a relationship, so yeah. And also couple relationships are incredibly significant relationship in people's lives. And there's a lot of uh, kind of consensus in social science research that that's the most, almost the most important relationship in your life and where you get most of your emotional needs met. And I'm also interested in seeing how these experiences don't just stay within like the MGMA time that you have, but also kind of ripple out into everyday life as well. So in order to do this and to kind of study the lived experiences of couples who take MDMA together, I use qualitative method, a sort of better method um, for looking at meaning, for looking at kind of the whole of people's experiences. And I did, I interviewed 10 couples using semi-structured interviews, which means that you have a kind of interview outline of questions that you ask people. But then within that, you know, if they go off and talk about something else, you respond to that and you kind of go down that thread with them wherever they're going. So it's quite a kind of flexible structure. And so the couples that I looked at were sort of uh, taking MDMA together already five times or more. So these are couples who were already taking MDMA together in their everyday lives. There was no like administering of MDMA of any kind. And the analysis that I did was kind of uh, guided by ideas from the philosophy and psychology of emotions. So this, this is just to give you a little bit of um, kind of insight into the like theory. And this is sort of helpful for when I'll be talking about the data in, in a couple of minutes. So emotions are a large part of what give our lives meaning. I bet if you think back to some of the most important experiences you've had in your own life, it's what you felt at that time that kind of really makes that experience so important to you. And this is not just recognized by kind of philosophers and psychologists, but also by neuroscientists such as uh, Damasio, who talk about how our experiences are marked by our emotional engagement with the world around us. However, it could be argued that in our kind of cognitive tradition, that emotions are being largely neglected in favor of the reason or the intellect. But it seems like we are our emotions just as much as we are our thoughts. There's almost like a little bit of a kind of false dichotomy being set up between, between these two things. And emotions aren't just kind of something which exists in your head, which are a kind of uh, self-contained thing. They kind of go out into the world. So they're a way of interacting with people, interacting with situations in the world. And this idea of uh, vulnerability as really being kind of at the heart of love and connection, if we define vulnerability as kind of emotional exposure, risks, uncertainties, that really seems to kind of chime quite well with our experience of love. You know, think how kind of emotionally exposed love leaves you, how uncertain it is. Um, you know, you don't know if the person you love will love you back. If they do love you back, you don't know how long they'll love you back. You don't know if they'll kind of keep your trust, if they'll betray you. There's just sort of a host of risks and uncertainties around that. 
So these are just some of the research questions that I was considering when kind of analyzing, collecting the data. So onto the data, the juicy part. So couples described what I said earlier as a kind of emotional bubble forming around them on MDMA, and that was somewhere they felt safe, where they um, had a place to be vulnerable, where they were kind of more in tune with their emotions and they could express those emotions better as well. And it was largely insulated from kind of fear or worry or anger, though not, not completely. And I use this metaphor of a bubble because, you know, a bubble denotes like a separate space, but it's also kind of transparent, so it's not completely blocked off from real world concerns. And just as a bubble pops, you know, um, MDMA experiences never to be come to an end. Um, yeah, and just as bubbles can kind of leave behind a sort of residue or a trace, so too do MDMA experiences. That's what the couples describe them as doing. So I really love this uh, kind of first really visceral image that Dan uses. He says, floating in a warm tub of warm goo. Love that. Um, so he's, it's almost kind of, it's almost fetal, you know? He's talking about floating in this, in its warm goo. He's totally protected from the world, from what's going on outside of this, this particular experience. And what does that kind of feeling of protection facilitate? Well, you can say anything. And this was something which was really sort of echoed across all the couples, I think with the exception of maybe one or two of the couples in the data. And MD may be triggering kind of uh, these feelings of love and warmth, but he, Dan's not experiencing them as a kind of self-contained thing just happening to him. He's experiencing them as being directing towards his partner, Emily. No matter what she said, it was like everything made me love her more and more. So these feelings of love are being magnified by the interaction going on between him and his partner. And what's remarkable here is that the conversation he's referring to, no matter what she said, was when Emily was revealing that she'd been unfaithful to him. So admission of infidelity, which is an incredibly painful revelation. So it's remarkable he's sort of talking about this magnification of, of a loving feeling. So this really creates a kind of altered emotion, emotional dynamic between the couple. So you have kind of positive or stereotypically positive feelings turned up, more negative feelings turned down. Uh, and this really seems to change the meaning of the information that's being imparted between them. You know, Dan says, you have two associations with that information. You got, when you come down, you're angry and you're pissed off. But it's also like the deepest connection you've ever had with a person at the same time. So just seeing how couples emotionally relate differently to each other in MDMA. But what about when uh, the MDMA wears off? What happens then? And Emily talks about how her experiences on MDMA, emotional experiences, give her a point to reflect back on. And the, what she's describing here is a, or seems to be part of um, kind of experiencing greater emotional expression. And she talks about being more affectionate. And elsewhere, she says she really enjoys how her partner, Dan, who was the previous uh, participant that I quoted from, how she really loves it when, when he says nice, mushy things to her on MDMA. She really enjoys that. Um, and this couple kind of talk a lot about how close they are in everyday life. They talk all the time. They spend all their time together. But it seems that MDMA provides this different model of being close, this different way of being close that they can then bring into their everyday lives together, which is quite powerful. And she, was, she also talks about um, having this nice, clean slate, this really sort of open, honest space where they can you kind of get the absolute truth out between them. But this is not just, uh, it's, sorry, it seems interesting that, you know, as a drug uh, and one long associated with kind of the summer of love, with raving, with hedonism, that MDMA can often be equated in research with some form of escapism, but that really doesn't seem to be what's happening here at all. Emily's not talking about, you know, taking MDMA with Dan and they're just sort of escaping or they're avoiding all their problems. Instead, she's talking about taking MDMA with him and then these problems are actually aired between them. They're processed, they're dealt with to some degree and they're wiped away and they have this clean slate. And not only that, having this kind of clean slate then motivates them to continue to kind of bring that open, honest communication in their everyday lives together as well. And Dan talks about MDMA as a kind of confessional space. Oh, here we go, it's like a confession time, which is something that MDMA is quite well known for. 
But what's really uh, sort of interesting here is that it's not just about revealing truths between the couple, it's also sort of about a lack of disclosure, which can also be incredibly powerful, there was no confession. And that lack of verbal communication kind of seems to really act to reaffirm the bond between these two people and kind of reaffirms what Dan calls a deeper level of trust between them. So just looked at how MDMA can kind of act as this sort of emotional reference point for people in their everyday lives, but it also can kind of enact a kind of longer term change and a more emotional sense of self as well. So Nick isn't just talking here about, oh, he gets a sense of what it's like to be a more emotional person. Instead, you know, he becomes a more emotional person. It kicks your ass down that road, a road he doesn't think he could maybe have ever have gone down without MDMA. And Clara, his uh, partner, talks elsewhere in the interview about how, how verbally effusive Nick is on MDMA. He tells her he loves her a lot more, he's just more emotionally intimate with her. And Nick equates here not having the vulnerable life with kind of staying on the surface when it comes to relationships. And MDMA seems to allow him to kind of pierce through this surface that he's constructed for, him, for himself um, and kind of allow him to be emotionally available, more emotionally vulnerable with his partner on MDMA together. I think what's also really interesting about uh, what Nick says, I think it really speaks to the kind of conflicting cultural pressures that exist for men. So on the one hand, you have this idea of um, having a kind of masculine identity, of being strong, of not being emotionally vulnerable. And then on the other hand, there's sort of a growing expectation that men too will share their feelings, particularly in romantic relationships. And taking MDMA for Nick seems to allow him to kind of navigate these two opposing pressures um, and just be more emotionally available for, for his partner, which leads to what he later describes as a, a healthier kind of relationship. Um, and this has really kind of replicated this sort of idea of male partners becoming more emotionally available, more emotionally vulnerable, was really replicated across the data set. So half of the women I interviewed talked about how uh, they really enjoyed the kind of more emotional side to their male partners in MDMA. Uh, and this seems particularly significant benefit of, of uh, MDMA and couples in particular when you think about how um, research has found women often cite a lack of emotional intimacy as a major reason for getting divorced from a male partner. So yeah. So to sum up, to really like take home from this talk that MDMA changes not just individuals, but how couples relate to each other on an emotional level. And this doesn't say confined to taking MDMA together, it kind of ripples out into their everyday lives. It provides a reminder to be more affectionate, to be more honest together maybe. Uh, and it also can change how one person's uh, kind of a more emotional sense of self and changes them to become more emotionally vulnerable with their partner in everyday life too. And this has a couple of uh, sort of main implications. So therapists who are working with couples, this is general therapists who are working with couples uh, who've taken MDMA together, give them sort of insights on the experiences people have had together. Uh, and also, rather optimistically, uh, in a utopian future where we have MDMA-assisted couples therapy, I think that would be a, could provide possible support for that as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. So, Katie, we are uh, open for some questions about this interesting topic, if you want to. Hi. Hi. Um, wonderful presentation. Um, I, you touched on this a little bit, but I was just hoping for a little more clarity on it. Um, did the couples in any state um, afterwards have a, a longing for the therapy, like wanting to get back to that place, or was it something that continued just to stay with them? Um, hmm. So I think, I think generally, actually, it seems to be from the couples that I spoke to, who were, particularly the couples who were sort of more using it for that, because there was a real split between people who were more recreational, more sort of actually wanted to use it in a therapeutic way by themselves. The couples who wanted to use it therapeutically, they definitely didn't describe that. They seemed to use it a few times, kind of get the benefits from it, and they kind of really seemed to scale back their mm -hmm. use um, to very kind of low levels. Yeah, so there wasn't that. Thank, Thank you. you. But let, let me take a word about that. Um, so uh, from our experience, it seems that they 
try some some couples try to tend to want to go back there because they are not so easily able to integrate what they have communicated during the MDMA induced state and uh, afterwards. And uh, what it could be the goal is that you can f speak with each other that freely, always. I mean, nearing that point. Right, and so therefore, some sometimes they come back and say, "Oh, we need that state again," you know. But the, yeah, try to near that state without taking the substance. I guess. Yeah, please. Hi, thanks for Hi. your talk. Um, I was wondering if couples spoke at all about physical affection or sex, and if there was any interaction between their insights in that. Sure, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, they did talk about physical affection quite a lot. That came up quite frequently. Um, yeah, they also did talk about sex, but I think maybe not as frequently, and maybe this is partially my fault as well, not sort of necessarily wanting to probe them too much about that. Um, yeah, but there were a few couples who, um, so there was one couple in particular that talked about how, you know, the lack of shame on MDMA allowed them to kind of share sexual fantasies they otherwise wouldn't have shared together. Um, another couple who spoke about how they did sort of use MDMA quite a lot for sex. Whenever they had, took MDMA, they would have sex, and that was a big part of their relationship together as well. Okay, so thank you again for your nice presentation.